Well, this is the first show we're going to do with our new co-host, Zach Aiken, <laughs> whose specialty is actually very relevant, very pertinent for what we're going to be going over today. We decided to uh, critique a video uh, put out by Cosmic Skeptic called Why Free Will Doesn't Exist. Cosmic and that just sounds really odd to me because <laughs> I really think free will exists. It really does seem like free will exists. Yes. And so we're going to go through this video for you guys. And I really hope he's wrong. This is the first point I want to make right here. Okay. Okay. Because I saved this at 27 seconds for a reason. Uh, but I realized that I've never actually talked openly about why I don't believe in free will, uh, except for my somewhat obscure book review of Sam Harris's book on my website. So I thought that today would be the day. Why? Well, I, I don't know. And, well, I can't know. That's kind of the thing. I want to take a more philosophical and purely logical approach to the problem. It seems to me that whilst helpful and endlessly interesting, it isn't necessary to reference neuroscience to make a good case against free will. So I won't be doing that today. Now, one of the best known current critics of free will is, of course, Sam Harris, whose short book you should all read. It's what really got me thinking about this originally about a year ago. And who okay, is a neuroscientist. One second. But you can also find discussions of free will in the works of earlier philosophers like Bertrand Russell. I heard Stephen who is his friend from Rationality Rules, who is supposed to be going over the neuroscientific aspect of the free will debate. I heard Bertrand Russell. And I heard Sam Harris. And on the basis of these three sources, uh, Alex has come to the conclusion that free will doesn't exist. Oh, well, those um, are the only three sources he mentioned, but I will... Okay. stay with you and i'm sure this is what you're thinking that but none of those three are metaphysicians who study free will for a living or who publish in the literature the philosophical the bona fide philosophical literature on the topic of free will and i think it's to the metaphysicians we need to look if we're going to be if we're going to be in the philosophical domain as alex mm -hmm. says here then it's to the metaphysicians that we need to look. And Sam Harris is not a metaphysician. Bertrand Russell got into metaphysics, but uh, was not primarily, this wasn't, his area of expertise was not free will. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Sam, okay, so Bertrand Russell's the best of the three sources. Sam Harris is a neuroscientist <laughs> and an expert in that domain, but he's not a metaphysician and very few, if any, philosophers, naturalist, compatibilist, atheist, anti-libertarian free will, or otherwise, take Sam Harris's work in free will with anything resembling a grain of salt. Now, I will say I did a search through Sam Harris's book. I looked at the notes, and there is a citation of uh, Dana Dennett, and I think he had some conversation with a philosopher named Galen Strawson. I think there's familiar with Strawson's work. Okay, good. So there, there is interaction. I, I think he like actually interacted with him. I couldn't find anybody else in, in the notes for that book where he interacts with the literature out there. So just really quick, Zach, I was just going to say something. If I were to start off a video on my own view of free will, I wouldn't even put Sam Harris's book in the top 300 books that you should study. There are a, me are a number of books that you guys can get a hold of to grapple with this problem of free will. Yeah. So there's a guy named Mark Bolliger. He wrote Free Will as an open scientific problem. Another book called Free Will. There's Dirk. And these, are, and these are philosophers mostly, right? Philosophers, exactly. And now listen, there are lots of philosophers people with PhDs in philosophy who um, have a side, sort of a side interest or expertise in neuroscience. And a lot of them yes. do work in free will. And mm -hmm. those are better to look to, I think, on, on an issue. Exactly. For example, Downward Causation and the Neurobiology of Free Will by Nancy Murphy, George Ellis, and Timothy O'Connor. They edited it. Did my neurons make me do it? Philosophical and neurobiological perspectives on moral responsibility and free will, Nancy Murphy and Warren Brown. These are probably going to be infinitely better than 
the free will book by Sam Harris. Just saying. <laughs> I'm sorry. You got a uh, free will, a contemporary introduction by Michael McKenna and Dirk Paraboom. Free will and continental philosophy. If that's your thing by David, David Edward Rose. You got mind brain and free will by Richard Swinburne. You got free will and luck by Alfred Mealy. That's your dude. Uh, the four views on free will, John Martin Fisher, Robert Kane, Dirk Paraboom, Manuel Vargas. You got the free will, a very short introduction, that series, Thomas Pink. You got free will. Well, okay, so let, me, let me pause you for a second. <laughs> I've, I've taken my graduate level seminars at yes. Florida State University. Good. Uh, Florida State University, according to the Philosophical Gourmet Report, which is one of the most respected authorities <laughs> on the philosophical expertise of various departments across the world. FSU is ranked number one in the philosophy of action in the world, right? So philosophy and philosophy of action is the domain in which free will is one of the big main topics. Yep. Um, so my very first semester at FSU, I took a seminar called free will with uh, Dr. Al Mealy, who was on that list. He's huge. Yes, and so this is, I mean, world, this is a world-class seminar on free will that I took. And Mealy is no uh, hack when it comes to neuroscience either. Um, we did not read any Sam Harris. I'm just gonna. It just doesn't come up. I don't understand. I'm gonna let you in on that. The, Sam Harris was not on the on the reading list. And just to be and clear, Connor was on the reading list. Dirk Paraboom was on the reading list. Yeah. Neely himself was on the reading list. Randolph Clark, who's also at FSU, was on the reading list. And the Robert Kane. Robert, uh, Robert Kane. Robert Kane. Okay, John good. Martin Fisher. And just real quick, though, Zach, it, that's not to say that that like what Sam Harris says might be false or anything like that. It's just that these philosophers have already have already cultivated this ground way before Sam Harris ever published a, 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 an ink blot on a piece of paper. And they'd done it with the philosophical sophistication that's that's born out of years and years of wrestling with this problem that isn't going to be reflected in this book, in this thin little book. I mean, it might be good as an introduction, but it should not be scripture <laughs> at all. Sure. Every single sentence has probably been contemplated and wrestled with by other better philosophers. So why not just skip Sam Harris and go to the actual meat? If you're going to come to an ultimate conclusion about what free will is or whether or not you have it or whether or not it exists, all that stuff. If you already think free will doesn't exist and you just want to sort of an, an easier, more introductory level read, then, then go ahead and read Sam Harris, but you're not doing yourself any favors. I don't he, think. Yeah. He doesn't want. interact with anybody. Galen Strauss and Daniel Dennett. I mean, I'll have to go back and look at it. I just didn't get Both much. Galen Strauss and, and Daniel Dennett are anti. I mean, I know Galen Strauss argues for the moral, for the impossibility of moral responsibility because we are not free. And his arguments are philosophical and they're quite different than the ones that Cosmic Skeptic gives us here. Free will. So for ease's sake, I'll go with the most succinct and least controversial definition that I've been able to come up with, which is this. Free will is the ability to have acted differently. What I mean by this is that if we were to wind back the clock in any situation, it was completely within the realm of possibility for you to have acted differently to the way that you actually did. For instance, it would have been completely okay. possible. To... That is not an uncontroversial definition at all mm -hmm. in the philosophical literature. So this is going to be sort of a, a, a loose... Uh, conceptualization of this PAP condition, right? Yeah. Because typically okay. this principle of alternative possibilities is going to be tied to this ability condition yeah. that we have. And it's going to be cashed out sometimes in terms of that, that metaphor of the garden of forking paths yeah. where our actions could either be undertaken or not undertaken. It's not necessarily yeah. like action A or B, it's A or not A. Kind of That's thing. right. And Alex mentioned something about like the roll a rollback. So yes, you know, the idea is that if I chose to eat Raisin Bran this morning at, you know, 1030 a.m. Uh, and then if we were to roll back the clock to 1029, mm -hmm. it's true that I could have chosen to eat honeycombs rather than Raisin Bran. 
Right, exactly. Uh, there, the, there are two distinct possibilities really and truly open to me, two possible worlds in philosophical parlance. And everything could have stayed the same and you could have chosen not A instead right. of A. Right. Keeping the past and the laws of nature the same, yes. yeah. there are still at least two distinct possible ways things could go. PAP, there, I don't think there are any philosophers who would agree that PAP alone is enough for free will. I mean, I don't know of many. All right, here's the control condition. I think it sounds okay. really like it. It's, it sounds like it. Beginning of this video instead of good morning. Okay, because I think he's setting these up to say that, okay, here's my ability thing and here's the control thing. This is why this makes no sense. And the choice to say the latter was completely within my control. control. The idea is that you are oh, in thanks. control of your actions and any decisions that you make are determined only by your own conscious self. But the thing is, there are so many things wrong with this that it's difficult to know where to start. Okay, so we have an ability condition and a control condition. <clears throat> so this next clip is gonna show the influence of Harris. And there's actually another video too where I was gonna play that video, but it, it might be too distracting. But this is, a, this is what Sam Harris says. Okay, this is a, this, he's gonna be a conduit for Harris, for Harris's book. When I heard this, I was, I just didn't understand what he was talking about. I don't understand why these, these kind of criteriological constraints that Harris is putting on what would need to be satisfied in order to have robust free will need to be satisfied in the first place. They seem completely irrelevant. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna go straight to this clip here. Firstly, we would need to be aware of everything that is influencing our actions, including environmental factors, our precise mood, uh, the influence of other people, the influence of past experiences and more. Secondly, okay. Very, very strange. I so, don't, let me just so, say it. We would need to be aware of everything that is influencing our actions. Everything that's influencing our absolutely everything. We need to be aware of everything, including environmental factors, our precise mood, the influence of other people, the influence of past experiences. You see the wording there? Influences. Influences don't causally necessitate anything. Well, why do so I need to yeah, be aware of something that doesn't causally necessitate anything? I think there are a lot of uh, implicit assumptions just <laughs> under the surface here, not very deeply, not buried very deep. And I don't know if he realizes he's making them or not. Um, I find this awareness, th this is, the awareness condition is really odd. Uh, I can understand something like a, a condition such that you're not caught. If the condition just was you aren't causally determined by your, by the factors that influence you to do mm -hmm. a, I could see, I could see that, but this epistemic requirement that you need to be aware of and be aware of what the factors are. I just, that's completely out of left field. I have no idea why that would need to be the case or where he's getting that from. Right. And he's going to extend awareness of these factors to the fact that you would need to be in complete control of every one of them. He said. One of the implicit assumptions seems to me to be a sort of philosophical determinism. Oh, really? That the oh, he's definitely uh, a determinist. That antecedent causes causally necessitate their effects. He seems to be assuming that. Okay. Yeah. Now, if that were true, then awareness would be completely irrelevant. I could be omniscient with respect to everything that's causally influencing me, but yet still have no freedom very clearly in a deterministic world the awareness itself would be just as determined. So how does awareness get you out? <laughs> awareness does nothing. Awareness yeah, does it would be entangled awareness. in the same deterministic web. Yeah. So even, even if determinism were true and I was omniscient with respect to the whole host of causal influences bearing on my actions, I still wouldn't have free will. Awareness is not a condition that plays a role anywhere. Therefore, the second point is going to be completely irrelevant. So he's going to go from awareness to control. We would need to be in complete control of every one of them. Neither of these are true or even possible. Now, I don't know if he's talking about causal necessitation or just mere influence. Okay, so let me, let's me let be charitable. I'm okay. going to try to be charitable. I can't. There's nothing more I can say about the awareness condition. That's just... Yeah. 
completely irrelevant, but okay, control, complete control. I see maybe where he's going there, and it might be in a similar direction to that of what Strawson was trying to say. Okay. Which is that, well, look, the reason why you chose A at time T was because of causal factors X, Y, and Z, right? Mm -hmm. The things going on inside your head, desires, mental states, you know, external influences, right? And those are the things that causally resulted in your decision to A at T at the time. Mm -hmm. Let's go back to before X, Y, and Z. Well, what made it such that X, Y, and Z were in place or that they mm -hmm. obtained? Right. Y2, Z3. Those are the causal factors that explain why X, Y, and Z obtained. Mm -hmm. Now keep going back ad infinitum you'll get back to a point you don't even know, you don't need to go ad infinitum you'll get back to a point to where the causal the causally initial items right the things that determined your earliest actions mm -hmm. are things entirely beyond your control like your genetic makeup your early yep. environment um you know the stimuli that were in your environment and things like that right so if you had no control over the very earliest set of sort of causal items that produced your actions, then you don't have any control over the next set right. because they were the causal offspring of that initial set that you had no control of and so on and so forth until we get to today. Uh, and such that you have no control over your actions today, now or ever. Right. So I think that's probably the most charitable spin we could give to what he's trying to get at with the controlled condition there. Yeah, but insofar as that control condition is linked to the superfluous awareness condition, it's probably just completely just futile <laughs> as far as, I mean, uh, that sounds good the way you said that. Like, we're, we're trying to be as charitable as possible and make it steel man, I guess. But yeah, awareness is just, unless they're presupposing some kind of like agential kind of awareness of these influencing factors that don't causally necessitate your actions, that would mean that there is free will because <laughs> we're freely choosing to become aware of something that may or may not uh, causally necessitate our actions. I mean, if it's mere influences, I don't see causal necessitation. And then uh, if they are mere influences and I have this agential kind of awareness, then I have a, an agential kind of control. <laughs> yeah. So I guess he's laying down the conditions under which we would be free but I guess at the very end of setting down those two conditions, the awareness condition and the control condition, Alex is saying, and maybe he's 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 a conduit for Harris here, that those two conditions are impossible to satisfy. And so therefore there is no free will. Maybe that's the best yeah. kind of steel man. It seems to me that the most charitable thing to do here would be to go with my interpretation of the control condition and to just completely forget what he said about the awareness condition. Right. <laughs> have mercy in that regard. Maybe his argument is that the awareness, the awareness condition is necessary because without it, we wouldn't know what to control. Maybe that's what he's trying to say. It would just yeah, be yeah, like right. in the dark or something. I don't know. Yeah. But here we get to the meat. So here is where we get to something that's just not even a breakthrough. I mean, this is something that I've heard compatibilists say over and over and over and over again. And the only difference is with Alex and the compatibilists is that He's going to think that this principle implies that there is no free will and compatibilists, according to this group, Alex, Rationality Rules, Dillahoney, Harris, I guess they think that they equivocate on the word free will from the videos I, I, I heard today, which this accusation of equivocation kind of begs the question, because if, I mean, the compatibilists could be right about what conditions need to be satisfied for you to have free will. Maybe they have this libertarian understanding of free will. And they said that it's not going to be satisfied once we look at the neuroscience or the philosophical objections in terms of what we're about to look at. So chocolate or vanilla ice cream? Let's see here. I need to want it more than chocolate. In order to choose vanilla, I'd need to want vanilla. But is this something I can control? Can I control what it is that I want? Not a chance. Consider the fact that you presumably don't want to punch your mother in the face. Can you choose to want to do that? This isn't the same thing as choosing to do it. Could you choose to want to? No, no more than I could choose to want vanilla over chocolate. I just want chocolate more than vanilla. That's just a fact about myself that I can't change. But I have a couple worries about this. 
I do agree that you might not be able to control your wants in this direct kind of way relative to the domain we're talking about. When we're talking about tastes in food, that seems a little more independent of my will. Like it took me a while to like onions. <laughs> I hated onions my entire life. And then when I liked onions, it just literally happened almost independent of my will. I was just like, oh, I kind of like them now. So in that domain, I see what, what's going on now with regard to like, um, what, what would he say about my mom? What do you say about my mom? <laughs> what do you, you say about my mama? You don't want to punch your mom in the face. Yeah. It, do Am I free to choose to will? See these layers? Am I free to choose to will to hit my mom in the face? Yes, I am. Now, I don't have the desire to do that. But he's going to bring up an example later about going to the gym. He's basically painted this picture of me hitting my mom and divorced it from all context. <laughs> so I can literally just kind of invent a scenario in which I hit my mom and, and my desire to hit her isn't going to be there. My desire will accompany my bringing about of that state of affairs, right? But it doesn't necessarily latch onto the fact that I want to cause her pain, right? And both of those contexts are compatible with the bringing about of the state of affairs of my mom getting hit in the face. It's just all these different kind of details need to be brought in to flesh this out. The yeah. third thing I was going to say is that there's this tacit presupposition of what you are an expert in, <laughs> of, of this causal theory of action. Yes. He's, he's tacitly it's assuming style. that the desires are efficient causes of the actions. And there's this kind of tacit assumption of, and this would be nice if he would have gone into this, but Donald Davidson and I have belief desire states as efficient causes of actions. Now, there is a huge literature out there on this, and the causal theory of action has been subjected to withering critique, and it needs to be talked about. And it's just tacitly assumed throughout the course of this video that if you have a desire, it's an efficient cause and it's causally sufficient for the act, period. Your, your, stop. your most powerful desire at a time T yep. is the efficient cause of your action always and everywhere. Yes, exactly. Now that's a view, but give that me some view. objections against your view. Like I would, I would hear what Alex is saying with a lot more uh, seriousness if he said, okay, and this is a view that's out there in the literature and you can actually look at it and these other philosophers besides Sam Harris, and here they are, and here are some objections against this view, and here are my answers to this objection. And I would take his view on this matter more seriously. He is endorsing an event causal theory of action, okay? This is a right. theory whereby the causal items that precede your actions, the things that cause your actions are exclusively events and states and namely um, mental goings on right stuff in your head desires beliefs okay so just like you were saying the Davidsonian style but not only is he endorsing an event causal theory of action he's endorsing a very um, sort of simplistic uh, and sort of narrow version of an event causal view whereby we've got these you at any time it, it seems he seems to be excluding beliefs uh, as sort of causal maybe they're causal factors but he seems to be suggesting that your desires are the sole efficient causes of your action not only is it do your desires but it's any give for any given action there's sort of a master desire or maybe he would be okay with sort of a conflux of desires. I don't know. What, what I find confusing and what I would love for him to get into is it's not like you bring up this notion of a desire and libertarians are going to be like, huh? What is that? I don't understand what desires. What are these things called desires? <laughs> Obviously, libertarians, both soft, both flaccid and hard. <laughs> <laughs> libertarians <laughs> are aware of these things called desires and they obviously construe uh, the nature and the functional role of desires differently than compatibilists or deterministic incompatibilists, right? 
And I would want to know exactly what the libertarians have to say about how desires play a role in bringing about particular willings or actions. Uh, and none of that is discussed. And I, I'm not sure if Sam Harris discusses it. I probably, I, I doubt it. <laughs> yeah. But, I mean, uh, the line is we need arguments for this event causal theory of action and he hasn't exactly. provided any. And it's a controversial view. And the really simplistic version whereby your master desire is always the efficient cause of your action. That version is even more controversial. Yeah. There are very few philosophers who would endorse that. Okay. So he went over the fact that you can't control your wants. And in this part, he's going to go over why you can't determine your wants. The key takeaway is this. You cannot determine your wants. Think of something you want. Try to not want it. Think of something you don't want and try to want it. It's not possible. And even if it were, in order to change a don't want into a want, you'd need to want to want it. Mm -hmm. And vice versa, to change a want into a don't want, you'd need to want to not want it. You simply can't control. Now, there is a literature out there, again, uh, by various philosophers, where you have uh, what they would call, I mean, it's in a couple different domains. There's motivations, there's desires, and there's reasons. And they'll have what's called first order or second order motivations, first right. order and second order desires, first order and second order reasons. Now, if I have the second order desire to change my first order desire, and I can bring that about in a libertarian, agential, agentially relevant way, and this second order desire isn't functioning as an efficient cause, uh, it's completely coherent to talk about changing your desires. Um, now, what is Alex going to say? He's going to say, "Okay, yeah, let's." let's I, I'll give you the first and second order uh, sort of distinction. You can have that. He could grant you the first order, second order distinction, mm -hmm. but he would want to try to hold on to a sort of gradation system, or like a like a something like a point system that is consistent between the two. So like, yeah, I grant you the distinction. They're, they're conceptually distinct first and second order desires, but their, their, the strength that they have with respect to bringing about actions is on the same scale. So if your second, if, you know, say the scale is out of a hundred, if your second order desire to lose weight, um, is, you know, 55, and your first order desire to eat cake is 45, well, then your second order desire is going to win out and that's going to produce your action of refraining yeah. from eating cake. Yeah, yeah, the stronger, this 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 metaphor of stronger. I mean, the third first thing that my imagination kind of seizes on with this kind of example, or when I listen to Alex talk about the nature of these desires is that you have a scale and you, and you put the both the desires on the scale and the, the heavier one is going to win out. Yeah. Why? Because it dips a little lower than the other one. Yeah. That, I don't think that's exactly the way the strength of desires functions. I, I need an argument for why stronger should be understood in that sense. I, I'm not convinced of that. Um, for the libertarian and how they're going to, they're going to understand desires. They're going to understand stronger and weaker in terms of, what do I have more reason to do? What do I have more reason to act upon? And these reasons aren't, you know, causally sufficient for my actions. And so according to the libertarian, the reasons, the deliberation that's involved in reasons uh, for strengthening or weakening particular desires. So there might be some kind of commerce between reasons and desires here for the libertarian um, is, is not in a purely scale weight kind of way. It's just you're deliberating. You're a rational agent. You have influences and all this stuff. They don't causally necessitate your act, which means that you can always act contrary to your strongest desire. I mean, I, we don't have to buy into the, the way they're framing this debate uh, in terms of if you got the stronger desire, it's invincible. Yeah, you can weaken the stronger desire with using your second order desires and having those second order desires be guided by reasons. Um, and the desires themselves can be reasons. They can be final causes. They don't have to be efficient causes. So all, all these little things going on in the background, behind the stage, behind the curtain, all that stuff, the libertarian and the, 
the incompatibilist determinist and the incompatibilist libertarian need to say, okay, what do you mean by all this? What do you mean by the string? What do you mean by this, this, this movement of this puppet over here? What does it mean for this guy to be walking across the stage autonomously without a, like a puppet master or all that stuff? We got to be, we got to pin down what we mean by our terminology here. Um, because we're both going to agree that we have desires. We both have an understanding of what efficient causes. We both have an understanding of what a final cause is. Just repeat my view back to me, so I know that you understand it. <laughs> That's what I, would we're, I mean. We're just we're we're just pulling back the curtain on the Wizard of Oz here. I mean, there's all this <laughs> philosophical baggage in the background that's just left completely untouched. And I don't know whether he knows that it's there or not. Maybe he really does think that it's this simple and this easy. But it it just doesn't. Know. It doesn't, uh, it doesn't refute the point. You can determine your wants. Now, a want is always going to accompany your endeavor to change a first order want. Uh, what's a first order want? I want to get a beer out of the fridge. Okay. Uh, right now I do, but I also don't want to put beer in my body, right? Yeah. Uh, how do I change what I want to want here? I, 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 I want to want to get the beer out of the fridge, but I also don't want to put the beer in my body. So hold on a second. Let me think about this. Let me deliberate about the pros and cons for, for, for the consequences of going with one second order want over another second order want. Yeah. I, as a rational agent, as an unmoved mover, I'm going to, I'm going to ponder this and go, yeah, I don't want that beer in my body. I'm going to sit here at this table. I'm not going to do it. Why did I do that? Because I wanted to. Was the want an efficient cause? I don't know. You have yet to give me an argument for why that is. That process of rational del deliberation that you're describing, you're undergoing, that there are your desire, you're modifying your desires in so yeah, rationalizing. I do think you can determine your wants. Um, I think you have indirect like control over what you want. In the same way that you have, you can have indirect control over what you believe with indirect dogmatic voluntarism. I mean, right. So you can, you know, I really want to believe that my mother has the best intentions, even though I don't believe it right now because I'm sort of callous towards her. Maybe this is fictional, uh, and so I fake it till I make it. Right. I, I all anytime I find myself having a negative thought about my mom, I push it out of my mind. And replace it with a positive one and yeah. i do that for months weeks months and eventually my desires and my beliefs or my beliefs have been changed i now no longer believe the negative thing about my mother and and depending on what is true is going to depend on whether or not we're going to label that as self-deception or something like that that has nothing to do with whether or not you had control over what you believed or what you willed or what you desired or whatever pick your domain so you got these okay. different like hierarchical kind of relationships between first and second order things in their perspective, in their specific domains. I think he needs to go into more detail on this. What would he say to all this? He would probably yeah, say, so well, I'm going to go to this. He's going to, he's going to bring up Arian Foster, the Arian Foster objection, which we might've already gone over, over. Actually, let me, let me play Let me play two clips just really quick. Exercise. Consider going to the gym. Most people don't want to go to the gym, but they do it anyway. Surely this is an example of someone doing something freely and not because they want to or because they're forced to. Not really, because there has to be a reason for going to the gym. And for most people and for Arian, it's something like to stay healthy, to stay in shape, to live longer, whatever it may be. So we have to ask again the same fundamental question. Why is the desire to stay healthy stronger than the desire to go to the gym? It just is. Or maybe it isn't. And some people stay at home and eat junk food instead. For these people, why is the desire to sit around or to eat junk food stronger than the desire to be healthy? Almost done. It just is. Again, remember, you can't control the strengths or objects of your desires. It's they that control you. And if that doesn't unease you, repeat those words again to yourself until it does. So even when you don't Here's want to do something, but you do it anyway, this is only ever because of a stronger and equally uncontrollable desire to do something that requires you to do it. All right. So even when you don't want to do something, but you do it anyway, this is only ever because of a stronger 
an equally uncontrollable desire to do something that requires you to do it. Well, first of all, free will expert, I, I see a couple holes in here. Uh, it kind of overlaps with what we, what we just said. So even when you don't want, quote unquote, even when you don't want to do something, okay? Now, right away, okay, is that one or first order one or a second order one? I have no idea. Uh, is he talking about the want to be healthy or the want to go to the gym? First of all, if I want to go to the gym, doesn't that already imply that I want to be healthy? Why else would I go to the gym in order to maintain my health? <laughs> so I don't know why. I don't know if he misspoke right there. It's like there's not a distinction between going to the gym and wanting to be healthy, wanting to go to the gym and wanting to be healthy. There's kind of a conditional relationship there. I'm going to go to the gym if I want to be healthy. <laughs> I don't know if you meant yeah. to, to distinguish those two there. So he says, okay, so first of all, I don't know if he's talking about first or second order wants. So even if you don't want to do something, you do it anyway. So you're doing something you don't want to do, Paul, Romans 7, right? <laughs> this is only ever because of a stronger and equally uncontrollable stop. We have no reason for why it's uncontrollable. Because we just went over how these desires, you might not be able to control the presence of the desire that's in you, okay? So at, at a time, so yeah, synchronically, yeah, at a certain time, yeah, at a certain time, you may not be able to have, you may not, be, you may not have any control over what your desires are. Exactly, but that doesn't, it doesn't follow from that that you had no causal influence over what they were in the past, or yes. that you had no say in the causal history leading up to your current set of desires. Right, the desires don't causally necessitate your actions. They influence, and they don't have to act as these like raw kind of like forces that you feel like in a lazy river. <laughs> uh, for the libertarian, the desires can function as final causes. So already, with with this comment here at seven twenty four, he's surreptitiously kind of introducing uh, indeterministic, uh, deterministic indeterminism language into this locution. <laughs> so I, I'm just not convinced by the framing of, of the con, of the concepts right now. So he's just kind of like equally uncontrollable desire. In the background, he's talking about it being an efficient cause. And I have no reason to think that, independent of whether or not he's going to motivate a causal theory of action, according to which desire. I have no reason to think that determinism is true and that right. causal antecedents co uh, necessitate their effects. Yes. I have no reason to think that an event <clears throat> causal theory of action is true. That only events and mental states can be the, can be the causally efficient antecedents for my actions. I have no reason to accept that view. I definitely have no reason to accept the view that it's like the master desire. That's the, that's always the efficient cause. Yes. Um, and without reason to accept any of these views, there's just no reason to be moved at all by his argument. Uh, two things, too. First of all, there's a whiff of unfalsifiability kind of kind of in the air a little bit. I, it's hard to pin it down exactly what it is. Neuroscientifically, I think, well, we, we both believe that neuroscience underdetermines the, the debate about free will. But they might think that that might settle it. That might falsify libertarian freedom. But how on earth are you ever going to be able to falsify this theory? Because no matter what you say, no matter what position, no matter what argument you put up against it, you always got this thing lurking in the background, this stronger desire that like made you say it. It's completely unfalsifiable. So for people that care about science and care about the pop, the popper criterion for what kind yeah. of science from pseudoscience, I want to know exactly what would falsify this theory. I don't think it's I don't think it's necessary uh, for distinguishing science from pseudoscience, but a lot of people on this end of the aisle they do think that. So I'm going to say if if you do take falsifiability serious, I want to know exactly what would falsify this theory. No matter how many stories we tell about desire modification and belief modification, you know, over time, um, Alex can come back with a well. It's because you it's because of what you wanted at the time that you made the decision. Correct. That was future oriented. Correct. Uh, yeah. I mean, so we, you can the, the view is consistent. 
right? It's not hard to produce a consistent view. Flat earth is consistent. <laughs> if you posit enough epicycles, your view can be consistent just about no matter what it is, unless, unless it's internally incoherent. Um, there's, I mean, there are all kinds of wacky things that you can. Yeah. You can, can do this, present. save the phenomena. They're not going to think it's ad hoc, but it's going to be ad hoc additions to the theory to account for uh, theoretical aberrations. But my second point was just that all of this is assuming that the, the mere bringing up of this desire point is going to make libertarians go, I just didn't know we had these desires. What, what, are, what are these desires? Like what I said at the beginning, it's just, you have to go to the libertarian and ask them, what do you think a desire is? Do you agree with the way that the compatibilists or the, the, the Donald Davidsons of the world construe desires? Do you know what the arguments are for why they thought that? Do you know what the arguments of the libertarians are for why they don't construe desires that way? They're not construed in terms of efficient causes. I mean, at the very least, they're influences, which are causally sufficient for the act. But typically, they're, they're linked to by the deliberative process of an agent freely. And they function as final causes. They function as reasons for acting. Why'd you go get the beer? Because I wanted to. That doesn't necessarily have to cite some kind of scale factor, some kind of internal state of the being. That's not what I would have in mind if I said because I wanted to. I would. I'm saying I wanted to because I'm giving you the reason for why I got the beer in the fridge. Hey, you don't. I mean, you don't even need me. You're the. You're uh, yes, doing. Do. Just, you're doing a great job on your own. Just. No, you have counterfactual power over what I'm saying because I would, this would never come out if I wasn't talking to you. <laughs> it's the it's the it's the uh, it's the interplay, right? It's the interplay. Just seeing my face. <sighs> it's so beautiful. In other words, all of your actions really are controlled by your wants, and I really mean this. This is what really convinced me of the non-existence of free will. If you aren't convinced that everything what convinced him is of that want thesis, to, it's what I'm wondering. Oh, right, right. So they borrow. <laughs> right, exactly. Yeah. So I'm almost done. Hold on. We'll to you. Please pause the video and just really think about this. I promise that any example you can think of has a hidden want lying behind it. Right. Yeah. So that, that just reiterates right. the point. So, okay. We, I mean, I guess we should give. Let's, let's. We wouldn't disagree with that. <laughs> we just, we want an argument for why the want is the way you're, you're needing it to be to save your theory. And Why it is, is the desire the necessarily the efficient cause of the action? Right, exactly. <clears throat> Why, Why, is the causal link Why is the causal link between antecedent and consequent necessary? Yeah. There are two reasons you will ever do anything, because you want to or because you're forced to. You see, purposely poked up on here. So and yeah. there's two reasons why you would do anything on purpose, because... You wanted to, or you're forced to. Zach, real quick. So, in your reading of the literature, if if I if you had a gun and I put my finger where your finger was on the trigger and I forced you to pull that trigger, are you pulling that trigger on purpose? No. Okay. Now, if I had a gun to your head and I said, "Hey, go," I don't know, slap that baby. <laughs> you're doing it on purpose. Yeah. So there's further oh, yeah. distinctions that we have to make here. Like things can be done on purpose and they're forced. Things can be done can be forced voluntarily. Involuntarily. Or involuntarily, right. Or involuntarily. Quick. Or because you're forced to. Of course, if you're forced to do something, then you're definitely not acting freely and nobody would deny that. So that just leaves... Because if you're forced, you're not doing it on purpose, but hold on. Just, he just... Exude. Well, I mean, look how confident he is. Look, look at. I'm getting sucked in, actually. <laughs> if he said the sky was purple, I'd be like, oh, "You're right." Oh he's got gosh. he's got books in the background. Look at my look at my plates. Look how intellectual they look. look he's wearing a button up. Look how thick and beautiful his hair is, <laughs> and he's got that accent. All right, I'm then. Convinced. All right, then, Zach. Look how confident he is. There's no hint of doubt. There isn't a single. There's no hint of doubt in his. In in his persona here. That's what works. It works. That's what makes people. Confident. That's what we makes. Right. We're believers. 
audience, whoever whoever's listening to this, we're right. We're totally right. <laughs> Sorry. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> but, well, we've already concluded that you can't control your wants. So actions motivated by wants aren't really free either. Ah. So being forced to do something isn't free will. And wanting to do something isn't free will. But being forced or wanting to do something are the only reasons why you do any Hold on. Hence, free will is conclusively... Right, so you know those things in the uh, airport? Uh, to get you to your de destination faster, you get on the, that little fast track thing? Yeah. That's, let, let's suppose that your feet become glued to this thing once you get on there. And then they magically become unglued when you get to the other end. That's the way he's understanding desires or wants. It's like these fast track things, these or escalators. Let's use escalators. You're get, you're getting on an escalator. That escalator is going to go up. Yeah. And you have no choice about wherever that want or desire escalator is going to take you. I want an argument for that. <laughs> Why don't you? <laughs> yeah. So that's kind of like the hidden assumption here. He is going to uh, go into free will being an illusion now. So this is uh, this is going to be a key point, I think, because the feeling that we have free will is quite strong. So firstly, and most obviously, it's easy to see that this illusion is mightily beneficial to our evolution as a species. And I personally have a similar speculative view of the emergence of free will uh, to my view on the emergence of consciousness as a whole, that it only exists because it aids our survival, but it's become so complex and ingrained in our biology that we feel strangely apart from it and have developed the fortunate or unfortunate side effect of self-awareness, depending on who you ask. But more than this... Okay, just real quick. So that was all speculation. Um, I'm, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna go into this part because it kind of veers away from philosophy. But yeah, uh, so that that's his view. That's why it's an illusion. So he says um, it's beneficial to our evolution as a species. Okay, so that's why our genes have fobbed off on us this illusion of free will because it benefits our species. And I think the evolutionary story almost just compels him to understand anything in our phenomenology that is anything that has just a remote incompatibility with it. You have to make it understood within this context of evolutionary psychology. You have to. You don't have a choice. And again, I, we bring up free will to as like a defeater for what evolution can or cannot do. And they bring up free will or the illusion of free will. They bring up this evolutionary story to inflate the intuition that we do have free will. They inflate it because why else would it be there? Because it benefits our species. That's why it's there. But we're going the other way. We're saying, no, the, the phenomenology that we feel with our free will actually is deflated by this evolutionary story that you're telling us. So they want to inflate it with the evolutionary story. And we're saying, no, the evolutionary story deflates it. So it, we're, we're just at this crossroads. And it's just really hard to know exactly where to go from here without going into the details of the evolutionary story and why it does deflate it. I think it deflates it. What do you mean by deflates? Debunk, like the debunking kind of arguments. There's probably like an evolutionary debunking argument for free will. I, I would yeah. think. So you're not you're not saying that the our phenomenology of free will um, casts doubt on the evolutionary story. I think it does. It as does. presented, as, as presented, when conjoined with naturalism. Yes, I would have to conjoin okay. it with naturalism because if you conjoin it with a with like another metaphysic, it might it might get a little more plausible. Like maybe like I don't know, idealism or panpsychism or something like that, like stuff like that. So. Now, what if we pair the evolutionary story with uh, with theism? That is good. They would need to be guided in some way. The phenomenology of free will is it it's fits quite comfortably into a picture on which we have classical theism and on the one hand, and then we have this evolutionary story on the other hand. Yes, so there's no tension there. Well, right. And like what Planinga talks about in that uh, religion and science book, 
there, there's nothing in the evolutionary story that says, and by the way, God didn't do any of this. That's not their role. <laughs> they just have to look at whatever they look at, the fossil record, they make the inferences they make. They, they you know, they, they go into like genetic mutations and uh, uh, transfers of allele frequencies, well, all this stuff that biologists look into. And they can't say, Oh, and by the way, there's been no supernatural intervention. That's not what science can do. <laughs> but guess what? The metaphysician can do that. <laughs> but, but that's the thing. That's why they have to reconstruct what naturalism is, because naturalism, metaphysical naturalism, is 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 a metaphysic. That's why they, they don't like it. They want to be method, methodological naturalists. But uh, okay. So he's gonna go now, he's gonna go into the distinction between uh uh, jumping and being pushed. <laughs> and he's going to bring up uh, this difference in experience between jumping and being pushed. So we're going to get this doing something on purpose and being coerced kind of thing. He's going to bring up a Matt Delahunty clip here. So that's 946. So we're actually right there. I think it's because there really is a difference between jumping. Unless you had anything. No. Okay. And being pushed. That is, there is a difference in experience between being forced to do something and doing something because you want to. Now, this is something that... Oh, right, and, and real quick, I would explain the difference in our experience of those two things by saying I experience being coerced differently from uh, you know not being pushed or not being coerced because one is an internal state and the other is an external state. But after I do a little bit of philosophy, I find out that the inter internal state was just as causally sufficient for my act as the external state is. So this difference or discontinuity between the experiences that I have relative to whether it's, it's an external or an internal state, tell me nothing about whether or not my action is being done freely. <laughs> that doesn't help me at all. I, that, that, I didn't mean to cut him off there, but that was my first thought. Matt Dillahunty has alluded to, Oops. and in fact, I'll play a short clip of him here. Now, this sound bite was also responded to by Stephen in a response that he made to Matt, a third video he's done. So it's just, this is the thing, like, it's pretty cool to have, like, friends and stuff, but they, they really are. It's just Alex, Stephen from Rationality Rules, there's Matt Delahunty, there's Sam Harris, and, and, and they got this thing, they got this, this, this club and they talk to each other, and it's really cool. And they got their own little inkling thing going on. I don't know. <laughs> but, uh. There's a lot. There's a lot more out there. I don't know. But again, though agreeing entirely with Stephen, I have more to add as well. I'm talking about it from a conceptual standpoint, uh, and the example that I'd used in New York was if uh, Sam jumped off stage, that would be him as an agent taking an act of volition. It doesn't matter if it was predetermined by the universe or not. But alternate. Wait, 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 wait. See, it just rolls off the tongue so quickly. It's an act of volition. I know he's saying he's making conceptual distinctions here. That act of volition is embedded causally into the history of the universe and the, and the laws of nature that govern that universe. We have to stop there. That vo there's something in the universe that's causally sufficient for why the volition is acting the way it does. There are these big unsubstantiated assumptions going on in the background. How dare you? And this is, I mean, if we can't, if we get nothing else out of this video, it's, it's, if the viewers get nothing else out of this video, they should get this, that they're, that, that Alex and Dilla Hunty, perhaps to a lesser extent, I don't know his full views on this. They're making these two massive assumptions. Number one, that some sort of event causal theory of action obtains and not just any event causal theory of action, but this really sort of fringe view where you sort of have this master desire that determines Yes. What you do. Okay. So you, you we've already got this tacit assumption about the event causal picture. Um, and then determinism seems to be, they seem to be, they just seem to be assuming that determinism is true. Yes. Libertarianism is obviously false. So we have to figure out whether or not the determinists or the compatibilists are correct. The determinist incompatibilists or the determinist compatibilists are correct. Well, so there's, there are these assumptions about the nature of causal links. So even if we grant them the event causal theory of action, even if we grant that, right? Okay, okay, no agent causation, no non-causalism. Those are both live views in the philosophical literature. But let's say we grant them the event causal theory of action. There's still 
debate about incompatibilism, determinism, what's necessary, what's sufficient. There's this big assumption about the nature of the causal links that obtain between the events, the mental events, desires, beliefs, and the causal antecedents, which are the actions. And it's that the nature of that causal link is one that is necessitating. And that is just completely unsubstantiated. That requires philosophical heavy lifting that, that has not been done. And that is controversial. I would make a distinction between causal necessitation and causal sufficiency. Um, causal necessitation, I, I think, is a little bit stronger, right? Oh, I think that's what that that's what Alex is endorsing. It seems. Is he okay? Okay, I've been, I've been saying causally sufficient this whole time. Either way, well, maybe you could get his view if it was just mere causal sufficiency, just as so long as that's the the strongest desire is the thing that's efficient for the action, and there's no competing Either desire. Way. Either way, free will is gone. Apparently, I could throw him off the stage. And the difference between those two events sums up everything that I think is valuable about the notion of free will. Right, what, what I think is valuable. So I'm just going to keep cutting him off because the way Matt frames this debate is not the way I frame it. Because we value different things. He values this experience that he has when he ponders the conceptual difference between throwing someone off a stage and somebody walking off a stage on their own without him throwing them off. I just think there's so much more to the story than just the experience I have when I conceptually distinguish those two states of affairs. Uh, and I, there's really no way to talk to him because we value different things. <laughs> so yeah, of course, if I ought to value what he's valuing then that's all I'm going to care about. But I don't value only that. I think there's other things to take into account. And so I think there's other things going on. Now, this is why I wanted to be precise in my definition of free will, because for many people, the first definition they think of is the ability to do whatever you want. But I think this is misleading. This, however, is the definition. Now, I'm going to agree with Alex here. Uh, I think compatibilism makes no sense whatsoever. I really don't like it. <laughs> I think that if you're going to go with these compatibilistic principles, that deterministic incompatibilism is probably where you should be consistently led to. What does it mean to do whatever you want? Remember, you can't control your wants. Right. So by doing what you want, you're just acting in accordance with something that's out of your control. It's more accurate to say, rather than you can do whatever you want, that you can only do what you want. Of course that's true. We've already covered this. And it's not freedom to be told you can do Of course that's true. Did you see that though? It's not the ability to do whatever you want. It's it's the fact that you can only do what you want. What what you want the most. Or what you want the most. What yeah, function what though means. is that word can? What 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 function does that word can have? I, I don't understand exactly what function that word can has. Well, he started with ability. PAP. Sounds like ability. <laughs> he's, remember that he started with PAP. Correct. So it sounds like his way of that can is functioning there to lop off one of the forks in the road, one of the one of the, branch, oh, one of the branches. You're right. You're right. That's true. You can only go one one fork. Yeah. You, you can only do what you want most. That's correct. Uh, but keep in mind that there are other assumptions in play there because there are compatibilists and there are determinists. Who think that you could have done otherwise hypothetically right exactly there's a whole philosophical literature on possible world branching and oh whoa, whoa, uh, did Harris talk about this because if not uh, you know come on Zach Why look there are, there are compatibilists who will affirm that you could have done otherwise because there are other possible circumstances where the past and the laws of nature are slightly different such that you do not a instead of a uh, in a counterpart world. Right, right, right. Exactly. Okay, so this lopping off of PAP, if his only mechanism for his his only his only tool or his only mechanism for lopping off the fork is this model of yep. this event causal model. Yep. That's not good enough. We need something else. We need it, I mean you need to to be charitable, it could be good enough. But we just we need a reason, and it can't There's, just be anchored to what you value in your experience while you conceptually distinguish different states of affairs. 
Well, there's this tacit assumption of, of determinism going on too, right? So like even if yeah, even if uh, indeterminism obtains, all right, if you know if indeterminism obtains, then the same the very same causal antecedents and look, lots of philosophers and scientists think that indeterminism does in fact obtain. Uh, causal links are probabilistic, right? So that even if we took his, even if we adopted his sort of naive event causal view, then it could still be the case that indeterminism obtains. They and actually the, talk about, they talk about that in the conversation with rationality rules. They bring okay. it up. They're just like, yeah, it can't just be, uh, Stephen was talking about this because he brought up like quantum mechanics and how that yeah. might open a back door to free will. And he's like, well, not necessarily. Cause if you have pure indeterminacy, that might be a, a bad thing for free will too. Yeah. I mean, so, so there, that's another yeah. can of worms, but it, I mean, it serves to undermine this argument. I mean, he would have to give us a different argument against free will. Yeah. If yes. indeterminism was the case, it might still be false that we have free will, but we would need a completely different argument and it is totally open he's done nothing here to show that indeterminism does not obtain. If indeterminism obtains, then it could be that the links between our master desires and our actions are probable are merely probabilistic. Yes, exactly. Right. And so then deterministic causation. That's right. There's a thing called indeterministic causation. And so then you still keep PAP. If that's the case, you still, you can still have your garden of forking paths. You prop the, uh, Action index to probability of 30% might obtain, or the action index to the probability right. of 70% might obtain. Exactly. So the stronger desire doesn't always win out, even if it is functioning as an efficient cause, if it's in the context of indeterministic causation. That's right. Um, so this is the last thing. This is the takeaway that he wants us to take away. And he has right. this, uh, he has this uh, catchy kind of catchphrase, I guess, to, to kind of sum up exactly what's he, what he's been saying this whole time. So we've already covered this. And it's not freedom to be told you can do anything as long as it's this. The takeaway from my video today to conclude this whole complicated and fearful affair should be this. Yes, you can do whatever you want. You just can't choose what it is that you want. And where's the freedom in that? If this video can- That's it. So, okay, once again, uh, he says, you can do whatever you want, okay, but you mm -hmm. can't choose what it is that you want. So we already went over everything to, that, that would address that. It just presupposes this certain understanding of wants. It conflates the uh, uncontrollability of having a desire at T with having absolutely no control about what those desires do to your whatever actions that come out of you <laughs> if you want to construe it, it functionally it, like that there's all kinds of things working in the background <laughs> yeah it assumes the causal necessitation of uh desires for actions or at least the causal sufficiency of master desires for actions that needs an argument it seems to be in, in uh, tacitly assuming assuming some sort of determinism obtains correct uh he assumes that compatibilism is false right that that now he does, he, at least he addressed Dillahunty on that, but yeah. the compatibilists would not be satisfied with that. They would want a lot more as well. So that's it. Thanks for tuning in. Check the video description. I'm gonna have some books in there for you. Books that you should read other than only Sam. I mean, go ahead and read Sam Harris if you want. We're not gonna stop you. But don't just read Sam Harris or just read Daniel Dennett. I mean, it's just like, we're always reading Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris, Sam Harris, Daniel Dennett, Daniel Dennett, Sam Harris. There's a whole bunch of other philosophers out there that are well worth your time. Um, hit the notification bell, uh, spread the, the video around. Um, we're going to do this for, uh, we're going to do this for a little longer. So I had been doing live feeds and Zach actually had the good idea of doing these recordings. And so we're going to do some recordings, maybe twice or three times a week, maybe once a week, twice a week, we'll, we'll, we'll come up with something. And we're going to do this for now. And we, we just want to put good content out there to help you guys out um, with the incredible popularity that some of these uh, skeptical YouTube channels have. And I'm, we're, I'm listening to them and I'm, I'm just very confused. I have no idea why they're so popular. So 
we're going to be another voice out there of dissent. Uh, honest. Voice of reason, a beacon You're of light in the dark. Convinced. <laughs> a city on a hill. City on a hill. But uh, yeah, check out the video description. Follow us on Twitter. Uh, we have a, a link to our Discord. Uh, we have a link to be a Patreon supporter. We have a link to our blog, which we're going to be active with probably, hopefully soon, within the month or so. And if we get enough Patreon, if we get enough support, you know, via Patreon or, you know, we unlock Google AdSense, then Matt could maybe buy a sheet to hang up behind him. Because I can't go to my office. I can't go to my office. My baby rules my life. Please, (laughs) somebody out there, buy us a sheet. Buy Matt. Let's get Matt a sheet to hang behind him. Look at these bananas. Look at this. This is perfect background. Very intellectual. <laughs> All right. Thank you, guys. And uh, be safe out there. And we love you. You can give me a fist. Shh. Oh, gosh. Hold on. <laughs>